Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Design for Computer Science. In this video, I'm going to finish our introduction to statistic indicators by talking about interval indicators and in particular confidence intervals. Let's get going. So in the last video, uh, we talked about point indicators and explained that they are functions that use data from an experiment to calculate the value of a parameter in a population model. We also discussed that there is an error and a bias associated with the calculation with a point indicator. Another way to think about this is that there is an uncertainty associated with a point indicator. A statistical interval is a statistic that help us estimate this uncertainty associated with an estimate. Let's remember the cable factory example. We have a factory that produces electrical cables and we are interested to know if the resistance of these cables is in a certain acceptable range. We can describe this model of the expected resistance of the cables as a normal curve with mean 50 and error 2. This means that every time we take a cable produced from the factory, the resistance of that cable is expected to come from this curve. Now, imagine that we did an investigation of the factory and from 25 cables, we calculated a sample with mean of 48. Because of the error associated with the observations, we know that the mean of a sample will not be exactly 50. But how much error can we expect from a random sample? In other words, is this 48 close to 50? How far away from 50? How do we know? When we calculate a point estimate, we don't know how far away the true value is from the value that we calculated. A statistical interval, like the point interval indicator, is a function that calculates a value from experimental data. It calculates a region that is likely to contain the true value of the estimated parameter. The statistical interval allows us to quantify the level of error associated with an estimate. This helps us arrive to a better conclusion about data from an experiment. For example, by using a statistical interval, we can say not only that we estimate the mean to be 48, but also how certain we are of that estimate. There are three common types of statistical interval. Confidence interval, tolerance interval, and prediction interval. In this lecture, we are going to talk only about the first one, but if you can learn about the others in the recommended readings. If you know about one, you can understand the others really easily. Let's talk about confidence intervals. Confidence intervals quantify the degree of uncertainty associated with estimation of a population parameter, such as the mean or the variance. The idea of the confidence interval is that we define a parameter alpha and the confidence interval will calculate two values, a minimum and a maximum. The interval between this minimum and maximum contains the true value of the parameter with a confidence of 100 minus alpha. So this is usually like either in percentage, like 10%, 90%, 50%, or as a probability from 0 to 1. Let's talk as a uh, percentage right now. So if alpha is 5%, then our confidence would be 95%, 100 minus alpha. Actually, alpha is usually between 0 and 1. So alpha in this case would be 0 0.05, and 1 minus 0 0.05 is 0 0.95, so we get a 95% confidence. When alpha is big, our confidence interval will be less precise. We're going to have less confidence. When alpha is small, our confidence interval will be more precise. We're going to have... Sorry. Uh, this uh, will be more. We're we'll, going we'll to have more confidence of the value being inside this interval. So, how do we calculate this confidence interval? Oops. Let's think of the simplest situation 
where we assume that the variable of interest follows a normal distribution and we assume that we know the variance and this value of this variance that we know is sigma squared. Then we can calculate the maximum and the minimum values of confidence using this equation. Here, x bar is our estimate for the mean, the average of the sample. This z alpha divided by 2 is the alpha divided by 2 quantile of the normal distribution. So if alpha is 0 0.1, then this will be the 0 0.05 or 5% quantile of the normal distribution. These quantiles we can calculate from software libraries or from tables. Looking at this formula, we can notice a few things. First, we see that the equation here is symmetric. The minimum value is x bar plus this z component that is usually negative. So it will be x minus this. And the maximum value is x plus this z component that's usually positive. The quantile is closer to zero when alpha is closer to 0 0.5. So bigger confidence means a wider interval and smaller confidence means a narrower interval. This makes sense. To have a bigger hit rate, we need a wide area. Finally, the Z component is divided by N, which is the sample size. This means that the bigger the sample size, the narrower our confidence interval will be. This also makes sense because we have more information about this population that we are studying. Here, in this formula, sigma is the true standard error that we are assuming that we know. But what happens if we don't know the true standard error? In this case, we can use this second formula. This formula is almost the same as the first one, but it has two big differences. The first one is that instead of using sigma, we use s, which we talked before, is the error of the sample. It's an estimate for the standard error. The second difference is that we use t instead of z. This indicates that we are using the student t distribution instead of the normal distribution. We will talk more about the student t distribution in a future class, but it can also be easily, calculation, easily calculated using a Python or R library. Here is an example of what we can expect from the confidence interval calculation. We calculated many confidence intervals with 95% confidence using a simulated sample from the car factory, the cable factory example that I set up before. So this data is the cable, the car, the cable uh, factory example using the formula that I just explained. For each sample, we generated 25 observations from a normal distribution with mean 50 and variance 2 and we calculated the confidence interval of that sample. Each bar here is one confidence interval, and the dotted line in the middle is the true mean, 50. We can see that most of the confidence intervals include the true mean. We color this green. But a few of them, and we color them red, they don't include the mean. One, one thing that is important to note is that the, when the confidence interval miss, they can miss by a big amount. We can see this first one here. This is important to understand. The confidence interval does not say anything about where the true value is. If it's in the middle of the confidence interval, if it's in the edge of the confidence interval, and if it misses, it could be anywhere. The confidence interval gives you a chance for the value to be in that, in that area, but it does not tell where in that area it is. So when you use a confidence interval to analyze your experiments, make sure you understand how to interpret it correctly. A confidence interval with 9% confidence has a 9% chance to include the value, but that's about all you can say regarding the confidence interval. Finally, here's an example of how we calculate the confidence interval for other statistics namely the variance sigma squared. You can see that the equation follows a similar structure. We calculated the minimum 
uh, estimated value and the maximum estimated value based on our point estimate and some values from an expected distribution. In this case, the point estimator of the variance is the sample S and the distribution is the key square distribution, which represents the expected distribution of the variance. So this formula calculates maximum and minimum values for the estimate of the variance of the experiment in the case that we are trying to estimate about our system in, in its variance. One case that we would like to estimate the variance is, is if we are doing an experiment about the robustness of a system. We're not so much interested about some specific value, but how much the values vary when we repeat an experiment over and over. So, to summarize our lecture on point and interval estimators. Statistics are functions that can estimate facts about the world from experiment data. The point indicator include things like the sample mean, the sample error, correlation, etc. They calculate parameters of the model that explain the system that we are studying. Remember that the point indicator is not the real value. It's an approximation of the real value. It can have a bias and an error associated with it. Interval estimators include things like the confidence interval. They are statistics that use the experiment data to calculate an interval with a minimum and a maximum value. This is better than just using the point estimate because it gives us an idea about how much uncertainty we have from our experiment. In the case of the confidence interval, the size of the estimator depends on the confidence parameter that we choose and also of the sample size that we also choose. So by obtaining more observations from our experiment, we can calculate a more precise confidence interval. We can also change the precision of the confidence interval by changing the alpha parameter. Now, what I ask of you is that you think about these point indicators and these interval indicators and then think about how you can use these calculations to describe the data that you're going to obtain for the experiment for your first report. To know more about point and interval indicators, please look at these recommended reads. Especially, this second one uh, describes other statistical intervals beyond the confidence interval that can be useful for you. This third one shows how these are used in a more general context, and it's very easy to follow. I, I highly recommend it. <clears throat> the first one talks a little bit more about distributions. If you are, don't remember very well uh, what are the concepts of distributions that we talked about in this class. So if you need to catch up, follow this first one. Okay, so in the last video, I will show very briefly a cold example of how to calculate the confidence interval for a set of data. This code example will be in the R programming language. I will not explain how to program in R, but it's very easy. If you want to have a quick crash course, you can look at this link, R for beginners. And you can also use the R Studio program to make it easier to program in R. R is very useful to do data analysis after you collect the data from an experiment. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye-bye.